Okay, um, homework assignment, right? How'd that go? Easy? Easy. Not too bad. I assume everybody got their drop downs working so you could select. <laughs> All right, let's look at that guy. All right, so you were to enter in a number of megabytes, and then it was going to spit out the equivalent in all the different uh, bits and blah, 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 all that stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's create that interface first, and then we'll write the, uh, the logic real quick. Um, shouldn't take very long. All right, so uh, I think what I gave you as a starting point is we read in from this text box. You click this button and it spits it out to this uh, uh, text view. Right, just so you kind of have those mechanics for going from here to there, and now you can do some mathy stuff with it in the middle. All right, so that means we need multiple landing zone things here. Uh, so what I'm going to actually do, uh, that's going to be our bits um, TV. I'm going to organize this just a little different, if you'll let me. So I'm, we're already in a vertical linear layout. I'm going to go to in containers. So I'm going to grab a scroll view here. Alright, I'll throw the scroll view in there. And the scroll view has his own vertical linear layout associated with it. And I'll throw our bits TV inside of there. Um, now actually before I do that, I'm going to also create a horizontal linear layout that I'll throw inside of my vertical linear layout. This is the thing you said you didn't want to do. That would surprise me. I guess we'll see. Um, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in this, uh, my bits TV, and then I'm going to throw another text view in there. And I'm actually going to put it in the other order. All right. And we're going to have this guy say bits. And then we're going to have this guy. We're going to have the width wrap the content. Like that. Let's make the text a little bit bigger on the second guy here. So we'll make that maybe size 24. Oh, that's looking pretty bold. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, we might be able to sell this when we're done. That's kind of what I'm thinking. All right. So we're going to actually have the number of bits here, and then we're labeling the bits here. All right. So let's like, look a little cleaner. Um, now, to kind of make this, make our interface a little quicker here, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to click on the text version of this. So this is the output. This is actual XML of our interface. So then down here, you see I have a nice little horizontal linear layout with my uh, my bits TV and my uh, text view in there. I'm going to create new versions of that for each of my other things. So this is going to be, so we have bits, then we have kilobits, then we have megabits, then we have gigabits, terabits, and then we're going to have bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, which we already, or we're just going to copy that over from that thing, gigabytes, terabytes. All right, let's go back out to the design now, and then we'll update these guys to, um, so this is going to be bits, this is going to be KB. This is going to be MB. Ruh row. Ruh row. All right, this is going to be MB. That is so weird. MB. Oh, oh, it wants to. It's it's doing a thing off this uh, strings. There's like embedded strings in Android, so it's trying to like do command completion 
for that. There we go. Kilobytes. Gigabyte or gigabits rather. Terabits. Bytes. MB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. KB. I know. Uh, it's a disaster. KB, MB, GB. Uh, now I need to grab my scroll view here. I'm going to have the height match the parent. Well, I can't get any more showing up in there. All right. Okay, we're going to choose the uh, Pixel XL as our that gonna give me the next. So who's constraining that? Not that guy. Okay. That's kilobytes, that's gigabits, that's terabits, that's bytes, that's kilobytes, that's megabytes, that's gigabytes. Oh, I didn't copy enough stuff. I got more stuff. So that was uh, gigabytes. Then I need terabytes. That's TB. All right, just cover all of our our stuff. Now, notice that the ID for all these guys are all called text view. Okay, that might become kind of problematic. Notice out here it's uh, underscored a bunch of these guys. So he has, you know, says we have a duplicate value defined earlier. So I'm going to click on this. Let's see if he'll automatically fix stuff for us. Uh, he won't, so we're going to have to just do it by hand. So I'm going to call this guy TV1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so on and so forth. So we'll call this guy TV1, and I'm going to copy that. I'm going to copy the TV part of it. This is TV2. TV3. TV4, TV5, whatever. TV6, TV7, TV8, TV9, TV10, TV11. All right, then these guys we want to have, these guys we're actually going to be targeting, so we want to give them appropriate names. So the first one we'll call Bits TV, second one we'll call KB TV, then MB TV. Oh, I named that funny. Kilo bits, kilobits, megabits. Oh, so I had the right number of things before. I just typed in the wrong thing. Okay, that's fine. So this is going to be gigabits. This is going to be terabits. This is going to be bytes. This is going to be KB. This is going to be MB. 
This is going to be GB. This is going to be TB. And then this would go away, or it would be an exabyte, right? If we wanted to have the next guy. But I'll go to hit down here. That's that last one. We'll just dump that. All right. Exabyte or thought exabyte comes next, then petabyte. You might be right, though. It might be petabyte next. I think you are right, actually. Matter. Yeah. No, I think, well, it actually does matter for what we're talking about here. I think you are right. Petabyte comes next. Then it's exabyte. Then what comes after exabyte? Is the petabyte next? We already got that part. Yeah, that's the, that's the one after petabyte. And then after EXA, zettabyte. Zettabyte, yeah. All right, so that's KBTV. This is MBTV. This is GBTV. This is TBTV. This is B. What should we call it? bit TV? No, this is byte, actually, byte. Bytes TV. And this is KB TV, big B, right? KB. I've clicked. MB. GB. And TB. Okay. So we have all the names now. Okay, so now when we hit click me, we're already reading this guy in, and now we want to go and fill in all of these buckets. We're reading in the megabytes, right? Okay, so let's go into our code here, and let's give ourselves our text views for all of our other guys. So we're going to have a private text view for KBTV. Private text view for MBTV. Private text view for GBTV. TBTV. Bytes TV. MBTV. Okay, B. MBTV. GBTV. TBTV. There we go. All right, then we need to actually hook those guys up. Right now we just have variables that are capable of holding those pointers. So we'll say, I'm going to actually steal all this stuff. So we'll say this dot KBTV is equal to that. This dot MBTV is equal to that. This dot GBTV is equal to that. This dot TV. TV, look at that. This dot bytes TV is equal to that. This dot KB TV is equal to that. This dot MB TV is equal to that. This dot GB TV is equal to that. This dot TB TV. Is that all of them? All right, then we need to update this guy. So this is KB TV. This is MB TV. This is GB TV. 
This is TB TV. This is Bytes TV. This is KB TV. This is MB TV. GB TV. TB TV. All right, so we got all our inter interface stuff <laughs> hooked up now. So now we actually have to do our math. We're reading in from megabytes, and then we're going to have to convert that into all of the other, um, all the other bases. Okay. So if we're on the megabyte side, we're already dealing with the um, a multiple of eight, right? So we might as well go ahead and do all those first. So we'll go up and down from there. So click me button pressed. Here's our int value. So this is, call this MB value. We'll just do these separately. All right, so now we're gonna say int KB value is equal to MB value times 1024. int b value is equal to kb value times 1024 int gb value is equal to mb value divided by 1024 now one thing we're going to run into here is we're dealing with these all as ints. And when we start dividing things, you might start losing precision. So what I'll do then is I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to make all of these guys doubles. And then I'll, when I do a divide, I'll divide by that 0. 0.0. That'll give me the, it won't truncate, it'll give me the full value. So double TB value is equal to GB value divided by 1024.0. All right, so now we need to get over to bits, right? So we're gonna say double bits value is equal to B value times eight. Double KB value is equal to bits value divided by 1024.0. Double MB value is equal to KB value divided by 1024.0. Double GB value is equal to MB value divided by 1024.0. Double TB value is equal to GB value divided by 1024.0. Okay, so now we have all of the values. Now we just need to fill up the text. So bits TV will equal bits value. And that guy is a int, or it's actually a double. So we're going to tack that onto the empty string. And then we'll say this dot kb tv dot set text is the empty string concatenated with kb value this dot mb tv dot set text is equal to the empty string concatenated with ay -ay -ay, uh, mb value this dot gb tv dot set text 
is equal to the empty string concatenated with GB value. This dot TB value. Oh, TB, TB rather. Dot set text is equal to the empty string uh, concatenated with TB value. This dot bytes TV dot set text is equal to bytes, what do you call it, B value? Bits value, B value, capital B value. This dot K BTV dot set text empty string concatenated with KB value this dot MB TV dot set text is the empty string concatenated with MB value this dot GB TV dot set text is the empty string concatenated with GB value this dot tb tv dot set text is the empty string concatenated with tb value. Yeah. Couldn't you do them like um, where you put the parentheses and then the plus tb value? Couldn't you do the math in there to just see maybe the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just verbosely gave us all our individual values. So we could just plug them in here. In fact, realistically, you'd probably create it, if you were doing this like in an object-oriented class, you probably would create an object for your um, number representations, have that internally do all the mappings, and then here you would just ask that object for bits and bytes and kilobytes and kilobits and all those things. So would, all, this, all this detail would be hidden inside of an object. It'd still be there, just encapsulated in an object. Okay, now right now we're probably going to have some weird uh, like things going out to lots of decimal places or something, but this should give us accurate answers. We can look at rounding if we really want to. So when we click the button, it's going to go ahead and read in the current number of megabytes, convert it into an int, then do the math for all the different thingies, and then, oh, I like using this dot, and then set the text for all of our text views to the appropriate values. All right, so let's go ahead and run this guy. All right, so let's put in 10 megabytes. We'll hit click me. So there's a big number of bits, uh, a smaller number of kilobits. It's a factor of 8 megabits, so 80 gigabits, terabits, bytes. Yeah, it looks, looks accurate. If I do 1,024 here, we get exactly one gigabyte. So, looks like it's doing the math reasonably. All right, so that'll cut it for the homework. Seems to solve the problem we were trying to solve. All right, so what difficulties did we run into on this? I know a lot of you were either refreshing on Android or this is the first time you ran into Android. Let's talk about the experience a little bit. The emulator was not booting? Okay. So 
And then it worked after that? So you had to reinstall to get the emulator working? Okay, but yours is working now. Is yours working now? What was the fix for your emulator issues? Because you're running, you're running an Intel processor in that, right? Well, isn't your, is your processor Intel? Or is your processor AMD? Intel. Hmm. I haven't uh, seen people having to go to uh, their BIOS on Intel-based machines. AMD sometimes has issues. Okay, so you had to enable something in your BIOS and then it started working after that? Okay, yeah, historically that used to be a problem with uh, uh, the Android emulator uh, before we had a tool called Haxm, H-A-X-M that makes your emulator run directly on top of your hardware, so it runs way faster. It used to take 20 minutes for the emulator to launch. But uh, the only people that really have problems uh, nowadays with Android Studio in any sort of bulk is people with AMD processors. Typically, Intel just works, so I wonder what the deal was with that. You know. All right, so once you had your environment set up, what, uh, what issues did you run into with the programming of this? I was on little device tools and wasn't doing that so we both by time adjusting. Now when you said you were having problems dividing, what were you getting? A lot of zeros? It did nothing. It just give me a zero. Yeah, because if you take uh, um, let's say you take a one and you divide it by a thousand twenty four. Yeah. Something like that. Well, one divided by a thousand twenty four is point something. Yeah. Right? Well, an an integer doesn't know how to hold point stuff. That's, so that's why I went in here and I, I changed it into a double and I made sure, you div make sure you force it to do the math as a double. Because if GB value wasn't a double, you know, so actually I didn't have to make this point zero. It would have done it as a double because GB value was already a double. But these guys, this did it as floating point math and we stored it inside of something that knows how to hold floating point values. You know, so what you've suffered from is uh, integer division, and what integers do when you divide is truncation. Okay. No rounding or anything, just pfft. they don't know how to do decimal places, so just cut it off. Okay. So you just got a whole bunch of zero point whatever, and then the point of whatever was just gone, so that's why you saw a whole bunch of zeros. Um, okay, so go ahead. Oh, did it work? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't recognize that as being a, a thing I've bumped into, but I mean, I do notice Android Studio sometimes a little chatty when you first launch it, especially with updates, which you'll notice is uh, over the next, you know, pretty much every two or three, t every second or third time you open it, it's going to want to update something because there's updates every 15 seconds. Um, which is fine. The biggest issue is just make sure you're on the right major version. So I had a student in another class who was running Android Studio from uh, two semesters ago, and they were still on the one of the latest versions of two point something. And I uploaded something to GitHub based on I'm on 3.01 or whatever this one is. So I'm on the current major version. On version three, I might not be in the most up-to-date patch. I think I actually am, but whatever. But she, her Gradle couldn't build. So Gradle is a, is a tool that the whole interface relies on. So it uses that to build your entire project up because, you know, all that uh, Android Studio does is it creates this Java project with all these extra things hooked onto it, and it builds it as an Android package, an APK. 
Um, and that Gradle is the tool that does that. Well, version two had an older version of Gradle. So I uploaded version, my version three version with all the Gradle config files, and then they were trying to build a Gradle file with version two, which didn't know how to do it. So Gradle kept failing. So that's why I said, make sure you're running the latest version, because that's a pretty common. Yeah, I did that because I did with them themselves installing, so I'm like, I'm ready for like the big version. I got you. Um, I don't know. Let's look. Let's see, where's my image? It's under tools. Yeah, the only one I built was this one. I think these... I don't remember. These might have come with it. Yeah, but you have downloaded. Uh, I, 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 I downloaded once, and then I tried to, uh, it, it showed me the BIOS error. So I tried to another one to download, and it says that you also don't have enough RAM. Well, right, but I didn't, I didn't download. Well, how much RAM is in your computer? Is your computer only 4 gigs of RAM? 16 gigs of RAM in your, I don't know why I would have said you didn't have enough RAM. I mean, when you go to create virtual disk, I usually just choose a fairly modern phone. So a Pixel 2 is going to have try to emulate faster hardware, so I usually just pick Pixel. It's modern enough and gives you a big enough size screen. So I just select the Pixel and then first Marshmallow is downloaded and it shows the BIOS error. So I try to do uh, Nugget or API 27. Then first I try to download the API 27 and it shows me the error that you didn't have enough RAM. Hmm. Well, hold on. Keep in mind that these are even newer. So Oreo is the latest released version of this. API 27 would be the next version of Android that's not even really out yet. So that's like really pushing the hardware. So if anything, you should have dropped down the lollipop. This is an older version of the API. Remember when we when we built the project, I think, what was the default API version 15 or 16 or 17, something like that. So as long as this number was at least that big, you were fine. So look, the oldest version that will even go on a pixel is a version 22. So I mean, you could have picked the Nexus 5 or something like that if you, uh, oh, actually here, look. These are the recommended ones. You could have done uh, one of these and gone down to uh, Jelly Bean or something. The uh, Jelly Bean pictures have the Eclipse. I think it's for Eclipse version, right? What, Jelly Bean? I think this is the Eclipse version. No. I mean, Jelly Bean's just an older version of Android. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you think about this from an iPhone perspective, this is like, you know, this is iOS 7. <laughs> You know, all the updates in there, then this was iOS 8, all the updates in there, then this was iOS 9, so on and so forth, right? And now we're on, uh, well, yeah, I did it. This was, this is iOS 10. <laughs> oh, no, we're on iOS 11 now. So this is iOS 11, this is iOS 10, this is iOS 9, so on and so forth. Yeah, so it, it depends on the device. It depends on the device you're emulating. So if I were you and I was on a machine that only had four gigabytes, I probably would have come in here and I would have done um, maybe a, like a Nexus 4, something like this. Um, so if we click on that, uh, yeah, we'll choose Marshmallow. That's fine. I think it lets you... Yeah, here's the. This doesn't have that much RAM in it, so you could even lower this if you wanted to, because your one little sample application is not going to take all the RAM on your emulated thing. But this is a lower starting point device. I think you'll find something like that runs better on your machine. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can. Because this is what this is um, mimicking is what when a Nexus 4 came out of the box, they had one and a half gigs of RAM. I mean, that is meant to be able to run seven or eight, nine, ten applications at the same time. Well, you're testing it for one application. Drop it to 300 megabytes of RAM or something like that and move on with life. Um, I'm sure that'll be fine for your little, you know, little Android applications you're, you're running. It actually is interesting. Very rarely uh, have I seen um, the emulated, because really what you're running is a virtual machine, right? So very rarely have I seen the Android virtual machines be too resource intensive for a laptop. So what we're really seeing here is, you know, it's the evidence of old laptop mixed with how fast, you know, how advanced our mobile devices are getting, right? Yeah, you know, so... So I think this, this is a, a Note 8, I think this guy has six gigs of, this has more RAM in it than your laptop. So it's just kind of like funny, right? <laughs> when, you, when you think about it like that, I don't know. Ah, before long, we won't even have laptops. You want to change the shape of the button? Are you working with Van on this project? No. <laughs> <laughs> drop, drop. I, want, I want the drop downs. I don't want to do drop down. I just want to change the button because it's going to look like a button. So, I just want to... so you wanted pretty buttons? Uh, just the station. Put on Hmm. Um, let's see. There are some button categories that you can download. Frankly, I very rarely build interfaces. So, uh, if you go to the click on this button. So, I, I guess I probably would have done an image on this if you wanted it to look different. Mm -hmm. So, what were you trying to mess with with the button? Yep. And go to the background. I found some vertical like you can change from that, but I didn't show uh, the that option. Background, uh, there is lots of options. Uh, you said, uh, ah, drop uh, a pink button now. Uh, up above, uh, there is a only background, right? I don't know. Yeah, these are images, so we can put an image up there. So if you wanted to have, uh, you know, what, 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 you, you, you want a, a curvy button? All right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to choose, for this example, we're going to choose a Pac-Man image. Actually, let's do Pac-Man button. Let's see if we get a button version of this. All right, so is our Pac-Man, a Pac-Man button. That looks pretty good. So we'll go ahead and save this image. Um, Pac-Man button. Put that in downloads. Then I'll go ahead back into my project here, and under app. In resources under drawable, I'm going to go ahead and right click and we are going to, uh, you know what, let's see if this is fixed now because the last time I did this, it you had to do it actually uh, by hand. So I'm going to say I want to create a new Uh, let's see if it'll allow me to drag it in. Otherwise, we'll just open it up. No. Nope. All right. So I'm just going to right click on it. I'm going to so, show reveal in Finder. So this is going to show me the drawable folder. And inside that drawable folder, I'm going to go ahead and 
Oh, that's giving me an XML. So maybe we do have to do it this other way. Let's create a new drawable resource file. Well, let me associate a picture. No, that's not what I want. All right. So I'm going to show in Finder again. I'm going to drag that image in there. I think it just shows up. There's my Pac-Man button. So I should be able to come in here and go to this guy. There's my Pac-Man button. And then I got to take the tint out. And there, I got a Pac-Man button. That's a, cur that's a curvy button. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you would you would have had to do uh, uh, either a image for that, or um, there probably actually is some stuff that you could have done with uh, OpenGL to during rendering to mess with it. I like the button Hey, here, look, here's here's alert dialog, small button, borderless button, colored button. No, that are not working. I tried all the things. So you just couldn't find the perfect button. So, I mean, the Pac-Man button is pretty good. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> did you at least get the rest of the project working, or did you spend all your time getting a pretty button? But the rest of the time, it's already working though. The, yeah, the, okay. Everything is working after the night. All right, that's acceptable. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to be all that helpful for like making really pretty interfaces. Mm -hmm. That's you hire people. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so like, I had some troubles like uh, moving it or pushing it, I guess. Yep. Maybe what is that? What's the difference? Uh, well, they actually both happen. So okay. we're using a technology called Git, yeah, right? right? And we're using the Git protocol to talk to a website called GitHub. Right. Those are two separate things. Mm -hmm. So when we commit, we're actually updating our local Git repository. That's saying, here's all my changes since the last time I was working on it. So that just changes something here, nothing up here. Then we push our committed changes. And that's when it actually gets to the remote repository. Can you, like... Again, does it override what you did already, and then push it again? Like I just did that. <laughs> um, what do you mean? What do you? I, I pushed it before this class and pushed it up there, and then I like changed it to double, and then I actually like hit push again because I wanted to see if. Like, I wonder if it auto commits, but if you're not sure, then all you have to do is uh, just go into one of your files, put an extra space in or something like that, then go up here and do. Uh, I'll do the DCS. Yeah, so uh, we'll do commit changes. So, you know, this is homework solution, whatever. And then do commit push. Okay. So what I'm saying That'll convince it that it's you've made more changes. I think I overwrote my first commit is what I'm saying. So is that possible to do? Just Well, you're not overwriting it. You're just updating it because Git keeps track of all of your changes you've ever made. Even if you overwrite it in the same your first commit, like say I, I label it as first commit and I push it again. Yeah, that's just a message. Just a message. Yeah, you could write a you know, My Little Pony fan fiction in there if you want. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, that has nothing to do with anything. That's just a story. Okay. Good. All right. So that's that. So now let's uh, keep trucking on their next stuff. We have not done conversion stuff yet, right? From uh, decimal to hexadecimal to binary to octal to base 26. How many of you have ever worked with base 26? How many of you ever worked with octal? With hexadecimal? With base 3? 
<laughs> well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Chica, was that a joke? <laughs> really? Yeah, you were just being serious. Oh, see, I thought that maybe you were telling a joke and I was going to commend you, but not anymore. <laughs> so you've done, you've worked with base three just randomly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll work with base three today. All right. So let's uh, go back here and then we'll come back to write some programming stuff uh, later. You know. All right. So let me see where I left off here. And it might feel like, um, because I'm not sure where everybody is with conversion stuff, it might feel like we're belabor belaboring it a little bit, but it's super, super, super important when we do assembly stuff. So we all need to be crystal clear on number conversions, moving back and forth between decimal and binary and hexadecimal, back to binary and things like that. So if you've done that stuff before, this will be a refresher. If you've never done that stuff before, I'm going to assume you haven't seen it before, or at the very least, you haven't seen it in so long that you might as well haven't seen it. Make sense? All right. Um, I also think the way I teach it is maybe somewhat unique and will help you convert between all sorts of bases. Because typically, if somebody says, uh, like, for instance, how many of you feel you can convert from uh, decimal to hexadecimal? If I give you a decimal number and I say, can you convert that to hexadecimal? You can do it. All right, could you convert from decimal to base 27? Okay, could you convert from decimal to base 34? Can you convert from decimal to base 40? Base 40. Okay. I think he is going to understand the way I'm going to, I think you already know what I'm going to teach. 40 won't work though. You want to tell me why? Or do you want to? You'll have to invent some new rules for 40 to work. You run out of alphabet. There's only 20. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if you don't get that joke, then you're in the right. <laughs> I'm about to I'm about to teach you why. Did anybody else get that joke? What I'm talking about? That you run out of alphabet, it's over most... Okay, so we definitely need to cover this. All right. And then I tell the joke that, uh, um, you know, then well, you, so you look for a, a, something that has a larger alphabet. It's like maybe so you look at Klingon, right? How many of you know what Klingon is? How many of you heard of Star Trek? Everybody's heard of the show Star Trek? Everybody? I had two students in my class yesterday who'd never heard of Star Trek. Never heard of it. I couldn't even imagine. Like it's you might not watch the show, right? I mean, plenty of people don't watch it or maybe never seen it, but you've heard of it. That's like saying if you heard of Michael Jordan. Now, you may never have watched a basketball game in your life, but you know the guy's at least an athlete, right? Super famous guy. So yeah, we decided that I'm pretty sure these two students are uh, Saudi, and I think their their television is pretty highly censored. And I really think that's it. So they don't, they've never seen these shows. Um, like, you know, just like I'm sure that there's super famous cricket players that if you follow cricket are, you know, household names, but I've never heard of them. So I think we just take for granted what's common knowledge. All right. So uh, we talked about data speeds last time. We talked about how fast your internet is. Um, I think we looked at this in the book, didn't we? The 1.2 stuff. Okay, let me just bounce to that real quick and make sure there's not something I want to say before I do number conversion stuff. If that's cool. One point two. Oh yeah, we talked about Moore's law, performance of Crowley. Okay, yeah, we went through all this. Um, okay. Did we talk about hierarchy of memories? That might have been where I went on to a segue um, talking about the data speeds and, and things like this. Um, so let's actually, just as a, a, a piece off of this, 
when we think about our computer architecture, so this, I'll just use their term, hierarchy of memory. A general rule of thumb is the closer to the CPU memory is, the faster and smaller it is, and typically and more expensive per bit or something like that if you want to price it out per bit. So just in terms of what we know in here, what's the fastest memory you can think of? Fastest memory you've heard of? RAM is the fastest you've heard of? All right, we'll... we'll Fastest. Fastest. Take, taking this as my uh, as my starting point. The closer to the CPU memory is. Cache. Okay. So you want to go with cache. All right. So um, we'll, we'll, I'm going to throw RAM in the list. We'll create an ordered list here, right? So we're going to throw RAM, uh, but it's not going to be the fastest. We're going to bump that guy down the list. All right. And now uh, you want to say cache. Any particular kind of cache? Because cache is kind of a, a catch-all name. What, what are some caches you've heard of? What, there's some different kinds of cache memory. L1, L2, L3 cache, you've heard of those things? So L3 cache. I don't like the way I have to do this backwards now. You made me do this backwards. <laughs> L2 cache. L1 cache. Is there anything closer to the uh, processor than L1 cache? The who? Say it again? Register. Registers, yep. So we have our hardware registers. Fastest. Okay. Think of these guys as variables made out of hardware. These guys are really, really, really fast and really, really, really small, relatively speaking, and really expensive if we were to price them on a per bit basis. So these, these guys aren't communicating. I mean, when we talk about RAM here, that guy's communicating with the rest of the stuff on your computer through a bus. You know, kind of a network communication. Pretty fast, but still a bus. Um, registers are literally soldered to the processor. They're, they're directly connected to it. Fast. Super fast. All right. What's the, what would come after RAM? What's, what's even slower memory than RAM? Hard disk. And then maybe if we wanted to, you know, we could say SSD, we could throw in the middle there since technically that's faster than our hard drives. Okay. Uh, after your hard disk, anything else we want to throw out there? Uh, certainly external hard drives because of the uh, USB interface is going to slow it down, not the hard, not the memory itself. Right. Yeah, external hard drive will be the same. But if we're talking about, you know, other components that aren't really things anymore, you know, we might throw in, you know, DVD. DVD drive, you know, then you have, you know, floppy disks and zip drives and all sorts of stuff. stuff that really isn't part of our world anymore, right? So we can kind of stop at hard drives. I think that's fair enough for us. Bottom line is hard drives. So if we think about these things in the context of what I set up here, hard drives tend to be very, very, very large, very, very, very inexpensive per bit, and very, very, very slow, relatively speaking. Make sense? You know, what have we seen with solid state drives? So if you go out, you can go out to, you know, Best Buy or something, you can buy a three terabyte hard drive for hundred bucks or something like that, right? They're not very expensive. You know, you can get a pretty big normal hard drive, mechanical hard drive um, for pennies. So you would use, what, what would you use that kind of thing for? How many of you have a mechanical hard drive for your machine at home or something? Okay, what do you use it for? Yeah, that's what I mean. Mechanical parts inside of it. So it's a big capacity, right? Yeah. One, two terabytes? Up. What's the size of it? I think it's one terabyte. One terabyte, okay. And what do you what do you use that guy for? Not much. It's one of the things. Okay. Um, how many of you have a laptop that came with, or even a desktop, if you bought a desktop more recently, that came with a solid state drive and a mechanical drive? Sometimes you'll see that, right? You go in there, you find a gaming laptop or something like that, and it comes with a 256 gigabyte solid state drive and a one terabyte hard drive. Why? Yeah. 
basically put your operating systems and your applications on the fast drive, the solid state drive, and then throw all your like long storage crap, like your music collection and your movies, all that stuff on the giant hard drive because you're streaming those anyways, right? Because when you think about how, how, why is it important that, I mean, a solid state drive is orders of magnitude faster than a normal hard drive. The, the speed is not even comparable. Uh, so we put, let's let's look up. We can look up some quick speeds here. Um, transfer speed HDD versus SSD. Maybe this guy will give us a quick just some numbers that we can work with. Do, do, do. Okay, so we can operate off this. Keep in mind that this does not in take into consideration seek time. Seek time is also way faster in a solid state drive. But we can operate just off this stuff. So in a traditional hard drive, let's just go off the, the low end here. They, when you get to these larger um, uh, mechanical drives that have uh, slower RPMs, how many of you have ever seen a machine where you can get a um, one terabyte hard drive or you could upgrade to a 500 gigabyte hard drive, still a normal hard drive, but it's 7,200 RPMs instead of 5,400 RPMs. Have you seen that on laptops before? Maybe the laptop by default comes with a hard drive that is 5,400 RPMs, one terabyte. And they say that you could upgrade that for more money to get half the capacity at 7,200 RPMs. So that 7,200 RPM is gonna have a faster seek time and faster read writes and you're giving up some capacity for it. We're still way slower than solid state. But, so punchline is this. So if we operate off this, our mechanical hard drives might be 50 megabytes per second, where we can have, you know, our latest, greatest solid state drives go even faster than 550. I think uh, Apple's new uh, drives and their latest laptops go 800 megabytes per second um, transfer rates. That's once you've seeked, you know, you, you have your, your seek time. Um, so like, look at this file opening speed, 30% faster. That's after it starts opening it. You got to seek to it first. And the seek time is really where it goes uh, crazy. I don't see the numbers on here. Um, but punchline is solid state drives are not just a little bit faster than traditional hard drives. It's a game changer. If you have the choice to uh, spend a little bit more money and get a significantly smaller capacity solid state drive, then keep your big hard drive, you'll be happier getting a solid state drive and just finding a way to store your files on an external USB drive or something like that for your, your movies and stuff. You'll notice that performance first. And why is that? It's because of the way all these guys talk to each other. When we double click on, a, uh, on, a, on an icon, stuff moves from our slower memory into our faster memory, right? So things are gonna get loaded either from our hard drive or from our solid state drive, both of which are slower than RAM, right? So they're gonna get loaded into RAM. So this guy here, RAM, is at the mercy of how fast these guys can get stuff loaded into it, as well as how much RAM you have. You know, if you don't have enough RAM in your machine, what your machine does is it has something called swap space, virtual memory. And what it'll do is it will create a, part, a small partition on your hard drive and make, use that to fake RAM. So you're faking RAM on top of an old technology. So it's really, 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 really slow RAM. <laughs> but it's trying to pretend like RAM, it's RAM. So you're expecting it to be fast, but it's not fast. So if you're using virtual memory too much, it's, it's bad. You don't want to use that. Go ahead. Do you think you're in a hard drive? Um, well, get rid of it. I mean, probably not. The technology might go away. I mean, so you know, you, you got to consider the big difference between these two. This is non-volatile memory. This is volatile memory. So non-volatile means when you cut the electricity, stuff gets stored over time. Well, right. I meant like between like the disk drive and the solid state. Like solid state's obviously. Oh, clearly. Yeah. You're, you're, these are going away. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. yeah they're dead. <laughs> well, it's not going to go away if you 
Um, Don't go away. They're going to disappear as soon as you can get your one, two, three terabyte drives, even close to the same price as we can get hard drives at yeah, now. Well, whatever. That's just making the solid states that much faster. What he's talking about is, are these guys here going to go away? Oh, uh, well, it depends when the data center was built. Um, that becomes a little bit harder question because solid state drives currently do have a problem with uh, they can wear out. There's only so many rewrites uh, on the flash-based memory. Um, where if you get kind of a little, let's call it an enterprise level uh, hard drive, it might be able to outperform time over a, a, a current solid state drive. Now, that difference is going to is going to get smaller and smaller as solid state drive technology gets better and better. In fact, right now, consumer solid state, I think, actually has a longer lifespan than consumer hard drives. Um, so really, I mean, I think a modern data center is probably going to use um, the argument is probably going to come down to how much data do they need to have and what their what their costs are. Because right now the problem is is the cost per byte for solid state is substantially higher than the cost per byte for a typical hard drive. But that's coming way down, right? Um, I don't think I talked about it last time, but we've seen this is related to what you said here. We've seen these patterns in the past. So, you know, if we, um, let me just drop a slide in here. This cost of memory is, is a really important topic, right? You know, all of us in here would get the absolute fastest, fastest, latest, greatest, biggest of everything if it wasn't too expensive, right? That's our, that's our limiting factor. Right. If you had a, a, a credit card that you never had to pay the bill for and it had unlimited, you know, <laughs> unlimited credit line, you just buy whatever the best computer was. You know, but what you get is you get what's the best computer you can afford. And then you have to there's trade offs. Yeah. Right. You know, so even today, if you go and you uh, spec out a, a, the latest, greatest laptop, let's let's use Apple as an example, because Apple traditionally are pretty expensive. If you want to, so the MacBook Pro comes with, the, the, the stock one comes with 256 um, gigabyte and it's a M2 super high performance laptop drive. So it's a solid state drive. You can upgrade that to a one terabyte drive. It's going to cost you, it's like a grand okay, to go to that. And that price has already come down. It used to be to the point where it wasn't even offered. It was just prohibitively expensive. Well, that's going to keep dropping, dropping, dropping. And you know, the, the issue is, is that um, many of you are, are young enough that you've never really seen how bad it was. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a real life example here. So you said you have four gigabytes of RAM in your laptop, right? Um, how much does four gigabytes of RAM cost today? If you were to go to Best Buy and you buy a four gigabyte chip, 30 bucks, 40 bucks? Something like that. So four gigabytes of RAM. We're gonna say we're gonna say that's forty bucks. You're paying retail, right? <laughs> forty bucks. Okay, and this is in twenty eighteen. Let's roll back the clock a little bit. Um, let's go to nineteen ninety six. So nineteen ninety six, I had a computer. Uh, it was a four eighty six. DX2 66 megahertz processor, and it uh, came with eight megabytes of memory. And so it had eight megabytes of RAM. How much do you think an eight megabyte chip, RAM chip was in 1996? So this is 1996. You think 200? 1000 dollars. Thousand bucks. Probably five thousand or something like that. 
Now, here's the kicker. So, let, let's do a little bit more math here so now that we've done this conversion stuff, right? So if we figure out the cost per, let's do cost per byte. All right. Actually, let's use the cost per megabyte. So cost per megabyte is 1,000 divided by 8 is $125 per megabyte up here, right? This is 125 per MB. That's the cost of memory in 1996. Up here, we have, we need to convert 4 gigabytes into megabytes. That's 4096, 4096 megabytes. So 4096 divided by, we said it's $40. I'm sorry, went the wrong direction. $40 divided by 4096. So less than a penny per megabyte. Less than a penny. So we'll round up and say it's a penny. One cent per megabyte. Okay, so my eight megabytes of RAM in 1996 would cost me less than a dime today. Probably pretty close to a nickel since it was less than a penny. Was the, the RAM though back then like was it bigger hardware? Like, did it cost more? Yeah, it looked, looked pretty similar. Now hold on, we gotta we gotta take into consideration inflation. We even done that. So a thousand dollars in 1996 was worth what today? Hold on, we, we haven't done this problem. We're not done. So we'll convert money by year inflation calculator so we're going to say a thousand dollars from 1996 to 2018 <laughs> oh he must not know about uh 2018 yet uh, so it's actually uh 1590 dollars so, so sorry we gotta we gotta do our math a little bit better so we're really doing a comparison so this is 1590 divided by eight so it's actually a, almost 200 dollars a megabyte so this was a budget you know so 200 dollars per megabyte how many of you think that's ridiculous do i know the punchline here that's after memory started coming down in price it was already cheaper then. It used to be worse. It used to be way worse. Now, our needs for RAM was also different, right? Because of the cost. <laughs> uh, we were very limited on uh, the amount of RAM we had in a machine. Famous guy. How many of you have heard of Bill Gates before? <laughs> Microsoft, Microsoft dude. Okay. Okay, we've heard of Bill Gates. Uh, famous quote, he once said, uh, you'll never need more than 32K of memory. Let's talk about kilobytes. Never need more than 32K of memory. Yes, we do. <laughs> this dude couldn't launch his Android emulator because it only has four gigs. Okay, how much more is four gigs than the 32K? So 4096 times 1024, that's K divided by 32, so he has 131,072 times more memory than Bill Gates said he'll ever need. <laughs> and it wasn't enough. It didn't cut it. Make sense? So our perception has changed over time. You go back some of, to some of our earlier programming languages. So let's talk about, um, and let's spend a couple more minutes on this and we'll take a little break. So when we talk about programming languages, and we mention something called primitive types, what am I talking about? What's a primitive type? Data. Data. This is data type kind of built into the language, right? So what primitive types have you heard of? So you have your int, float. Right, I'm going to put these in a certain order here. Char, 
float double. Who? Long? Miss anything? These are all, most of these are numbers. Missing one guy that comes before short. We already got int. Byte. Now, we're going to write something here. So bytes hold signed whole numbers. Shorts hold signed hold numbers. Ints hold signed hold numbers. Longs hold signed hold numbers. We have four different types. These guys, these guys come from the C programming language. All right, we have four different types here that all are capable of holding signed whole numbers. What does it mean for a number to be signed? Well, what's the difference between a signed and an unsigned number? Yeah, signed numbers can hold positive and negative numbers. Unsigned numbers can't. All right? So, signed numbers means it can hold positive and negative whole numbers. No decimal points. So, I have four different kinds of types. So, four different types that are all built for holding the exact same kinds of things. Why? Ah, so what's the difference between these? Okay, so a byte, how big's a byte? This guy is 8 bits. A short is 16 bits. An int is 32 bits. A long is 64 bits. Make sense? So, what's the range of values? If we think about that then. What's the range of values that a byte can hold? If a byte is an 8-bit signed integer or signed whole number, what's the smallest value that fits in a byte? Minus 128. Okay, so minus 128. And what's the largest value? Positive 127. So now the question is, is how do we get that? So you have eight bits to work with, right, for a byte. So smallest number is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, like that. But now this value, only seven of those guys are actually being used for value. This last bit is being used for sign. And we're going to talk about this uh, um, probably next class, I guess. But uh, um, does anybody know how computers typically represent uh, negative numbers? All right, so you want to say either a 1 or a 0 over here? All right, that, that's kind of the, like, the original way, old, old, old school. Okay, today we use something called what's called two's complement. Okay, we use something called two's complement. We'll, we'll, we'll review that stuff. So we encode it for performance reasons. All right, but bottom line is if we have a signed whole number, one of those bits is going to be reserved for representing the sign, whatever that means. So that means we actually only have seven bits to work with. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is the 1s place, 2s, 4s, 8s, 16s, 32s, 64s. So this is 64 plus 32 plus 16 uh, plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 um, plus 1, which should equal 127. Right? All right. So that's the range of values. We get the negative 128 because of how 2s complement ends up working. You get one extra value on there because we need to code it. So that's a negative 128 to positive 127. So this is plus or minus 2 to the 7th power. 
since it's signed, one of those bits is used to represent the sign. Make sense? All right, so back to these primitive type things here. We go back to C, let's call that the late 60s, 1968-ish, when the C language was kind of a thing. Um, all these primitive types were available to us. Well, the amount of memory we were working with in our computers in 1968 was little, right? I mean, let's, let's look at this. Uh, typical computer 1968. See if we can get some specs. History of personal computers is going to give us something. <laughs> the 1834 analytical engine. 1968. All right, so in 1969, that'll be close enough for us, right? Close enough for darts and hand grenades. Intel had a one kilobyte RAM chip. I bet you it was expensive. <laughs> I mean, I don't, even, I don't even want to think about it. I bet you that thing was just thousands and thousands of dollars. This was the largest to date. Oh, my gosh. How much was one kilobyte RAM chip in 1969? <laughs> Memory prices. All right. <laughs> Cost per megabyte in uh, 1965 was $2.6 million. <laughs> 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 so, so if we want to just, uh, you know, brush this up a little bit you know we throw a 1965 in here just call this a cool one point what was it 1.6 mil per megabyte <laughs> so it's expensive all right it was it was expensive um so that meant if we kind of operate off 1970 here if it was seven hundred and thirty four thousand dollars for a megabyte 734 gets you one megabyte. A megabyte is a thousand twenty four kilobytes. So that is seven hundred and sixteen dollars for that one K chip. Is that right? Yeah, 1,024. No, that it can't be right. It's going to be more than that. So 734,000 got you 1,024 kilobytes. Yeah, that's right. So it got you 1,024 of those. Yeah, so $717 for that one kilobyte chip. So very little memory for... Pretty high price. Plus, we got to, oh, we got to do the inflation. <laughs> so, seven hundred and sixteen dollars. Yeah. So seven sixteen, and that was nineteen seventy. Uh, I thought we were operating off the nineteen seventy chart. Yeah. Ah, yeah, forty six hundred. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so I was right. It was thousands by today's standards. So 4600 bucks for that one kilobyte chip RAM in 1970. It's a little rich. All right, so 
consider back then. So you had, you know, the C programming language was out right at that point in time. So we could all just kind of agree that memory was really, really, really expensive. Clearly. All right. So with that in mind, our early programming languages had to give us as programmers had to give us tools for us to consider when I'm going to store this number, I want to use the smallest footprint possible to hold this number. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to be wasteful at all because being wasteful is going to cost thousands of dollars, right? That's, that's how it was back then. Do we care today? Pfft, throw it in an int. If it doesn't fit, put it in a long. We don't care. We saw today our cost per mega, our cost per megabyte is nothing. You could probably spend 10 minutes in Concordia's parking lot and get enough cents to buy my RAM chip from, <laughs> from 1996. No problem. All right, so uh, our limitations are different today. Make sense? All right, let's take about a 10 minute uh, break, come back, do some number conversion um, stuff now that we kind of talked about this. So let's so come back at 36-ish. You know, 